Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today, we're going to troubleshoot and modify a vacuum tube audio amplifier. And as usual, I'll show you a lot of hints, tips, and tricks along the way. So let's get started. In the previous video, we found that this amplifier could use a few modifications to make it perform just a little bit better. And one of those modifications was moving the reactor that was originally mounted here and put it on the side of the chassis here to lower the hum level quite substantially, actually. So this really is a catch-22 and it's a little bit of a balance point. The actual spot that I would like to have mounted this in was right over here and a little closer to the chassis. The problem with that is, is basically the bulge from the windings. Now, in order to fit this thing in here, this is some sort of a, almost like a, looks like butyl tape has been put on here and it was stuck to this capacitor. So this, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just somebody's put some black kind of a butyl tape on here. So at any rate, in order to mount this thing in, in the exact spot that I would like to put this in, is this comes too close to the pins on the tube socket. And this here is going to be too close to the bottom cover that sits here. So the best area to mount that is right in this area here. There's a bit of an open area, so I can mount it just a little further down into the chassis. And that'll space this away from the bottom portion of the panel here because, you know, there's when there's no load on the amplifier when you first turn it on, there's 600 volts on the windings. You don't want this too close to the bottom. So again, that catch 22, so it's a balance between fitting this thing in and getting the hum as low as I can. And it worked out to be right in this area right here. So this will fit onto these standoffs right here. There's still quite an open area under here. You can see that it's far away from the actual, the lugs on the bottom of the tube socket. And there's a lot of area under here. And on top here, if you could see, there's about that much the space between my fingers, about that much room between this and the bottom cover. So that should be ample room. Now this is where this is gonna be mounted. And off camera, I've already done this. I've put the two standoffs in here. I'll just put this reactor out of the way. So I've already put the two standoffs in here. You see that they're mounted to the side here. There's two screws right here. So that'll get mounted. And in order to do that, I also had to move the negative bias board here. There's a, a terminal tie strip, I should say. I had to move that over to this side right here so that I can get the clearance in this area. Now, since I'm in here and I've already replaced these capacitors, it would only make sense to get rid of these capacitors and replace them with an extremely high quality, high lifespan capacitor. So these are just pretty much standard style capacitors and I'm gonna be using 12 and 20,000 hour, 105 degree C capacitors in this area here. So that'll all get replaced, replace all of these things. Move this over. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. I'll get this mounted in here. And then we'll take a look at the hum level on the oscilloscope again and see, you know, make sure that it's down. You don't want to move too many steps between each modification just in case we find that, you know, one modification lowers the hum level, then we do something else and then it comes back up again. So step by step, we're going to slowly lower the hum level together and discover any other things that need to be changed. Now, in the previous video, I also talked about changing out this bias control. That will also be done in this video as well. I'll put that countersunk bias control in here. And that way there's no you know, way to actually bump this with your hand and readjust the bias and cause all sorts of issues. So quite a few things to make this amplifier work and perform, well, let's say a fair amount better. I've now mounted the reactor to the side of the chassis with these standoffs here. And as you can see, it's extremely solid. This is not going anywhere anytime soon. And there's lots of room to spare. So there's a lot of room underneath the reactor and there'll be quite a bit of room between this and the bottom cover. I've also replaced all the electrolytic capacitors in the power supply now. I've changed these ones here. These two here are in the negative bias supply. And this capacitor here is in the rectified heater supply for the 12AX7, all brand new electrolytic capacitors. I haven't changed the bias pot yet, so we'll do that here in just a little bit. Let's first check the performance now that this is moved. So if you recall in the previous video, when this reactor was mounted down in here, we had roughly five to six millivolts of hum present at the speaker terminals with the amplifier on and biased properly. 
Now what we're going to do is take a look at the oscilloscope and now that this is mounted to the side, we'll take note of the change. This is the result with the reactor now mounted to the side of the chassis in this amplifier. So we're down to about one millivolt worth of basically noise and hum at this point. So not too bad for basically having to compromise between fitting the reactor in the optimum area and you know getting the noise to its absolute lowest point. So really we're only dealing with maybe three, 400 microvolts worth of difference between this in the optimum area. So I'm very happy with the results and that reactor will stay there. So basically what I'm gonna do is make a template now and that template will be used for the second amplifier. So this reactor and the other amplifier will be in the exact same spot as it is in this amplifier here. So now on to changing the bias control. The next thing on the to-do list is to get rid of this bias control and replace it with this high quality Allen Bradley control. The reason that I want to replace this control with this one is this one here has a countersunk adjustment. Now this is a pretty straightforward swap, basically just remove the retainer nut on the other side and desolder a few wires and just put this in place and resolder the wires up again and we have a nice countersunk control that won't be misadjusted if you know it's ever bumped or anything like that. So this has to be adjusted with, you know, just a slotted screwdriver. And once this is adjusted, this can be left alone. With this particular type of control, with that shaft that's sticking out of the back, if you're ever moving speaker wires around, or say you're, you know, behind your stereo stand or something like that, it's always going to be in the back of your mind, oh, did I bump that control? So you don't have a meter attached to this thing all the time. And just say you did bump the control, say you bump this bias control. What'll end up happening is the EL34s will pull excessive amount of current for a period of time. And you know, that's gonna put a lot of time on the tubes. Not only that, it's gonna make components hotter in the amplifier. So you really wanna have that bias set properly and then it shouldn't be tampered with after that. Now there is a procedure if you, you know, put brand new tubes in an amplifier like this, you're gonna to wanna to, you know, basically let them burn in for a while. And then, you know, you're going to have to recheck the bias every so often just to make sure that it's you know, pretty much in the same area. But, you know, once you've had a, a set of tubes in an amplifier like this for a long period of time and they have been burnt in, basically it's a set it and forget it kind of control for a long period of time. Of course, you're going to want to check it every now and then, but um, it's not going to be as frequent as if you just, you know, retubed your entire amplifier. So that's what I'm going to do now. Get rid of this control, put this one in and... We'll set the bias up and see how that looks on the meter. The new bias control is now installed. I have the current meter sitting on an insulated piece of material inside the chassis so I can get the meter in the shot. So what I'll do is I'll make the adjustment to the bias now. So the amplifier has been on for quite a while. It's nice and stable. So they say it should be up to about 220 to 230 mils. Bring it up to around 220, right about there. And the bias is set. And now there is no way to misadjust the bias. Everything is countersunk, nice and safe. For those of you that are designing vacuum tube power amplifiers or power supplies, anything that uses a reactor, this information is going to be very beneficial to you. This kind of stuff just isn't talked about anymore. Why, I really don't know, because this is even a common problem in modern power supplies. So I'll get into all of this here in just a minute. What we're going to do is go through the entire troubleshooting process and find out why this reactor is doing what it's doing. Now you might think, well, what's the thing doing? It's filtering and the hum level is nice and low. Well. This thing has quite an audible buzz to it. Now, you might not hear it in the microphone right now, and it's not all that incredibly loud, but if I was to put the cover on the bottom of this thing and say I had the other one in a stereo stand as well, so two of these mono blocks sitting there in a very quiet room, you would hear this kind of a nauseating buzz off in the background. And that nauseating buzz is coming from this thing. Now, normally reactors are supposed to have a hum to them, but they really don't have an audible buzz. So there's something going on in this circuit 
that's causing this thing to buzz. So what I'm going to do is just move the microphone very close to this thing and let you hear what I'm talking about. So this is what the buzz sounds like from this reactor, and this is what we want to get rid of. So you can imagine in a really quiet room, that would get pretty nauseating you know, very fast. So let's look into why this is doing this. So you're not quite sure whether the reactor in your vacuum tube amplifier or power supply is making the right noises or not. Well, this can very easily be verified with the Carlson Super Probe very quickly. All you do is you put the probe in the detection or noise mode, turn the probe on. So now what I'll do is I'll connect the ground to the chassis. This has been my ground or common throughout this entire modification process. So now what I'm going to do is turn the audio up on the Carlson Super Probe, and you'll see it's sitting dead quiet. See? Nothing here. Now watch what happens when I get it close to this reactor. If this was working correctly, this would not be making this noise right now. It would sit quiet like this. And I'm going to demonstrate this further here in just a little bit. So if you don't have an oscilloscope or say, you know, it's on your bench and you don't have probes on it or something, kind of like mine, I never have probes on my scope until I need it, right? So it's very easy just to break the Carlson Super Probe out and then just scan around things and look for noises. Very handy for looking for crackles and intermittents and things like that as well. So this is not supposed to be there. And I will demonstrate this further very, very shortly. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what's happening on an oscilloscope and I'll explain what this is actually doing and how we can go about getting rid of this. On the original schematic, there were no parts included to get rid of this. So unless they were removed somewhere down the road in both amplifiers, I really don't know, but both amplifiers are missing some crucial components to stop this from doing that. At any rate, let's take a look at the oscilloscope and I'll explain exactly what I'm doing. We're now looking at the screen of a Tektronix Type 547 oscilloscope. Now you might be asking yourself, why are you using this large old scope to display what we're going to be looking at? Well, I'm going to be hooking the vertical section of this scope directly into the power supply of this amplifier and there's about 650 volts peak where I'm going to be attaching this. So this scope will deal with this with ease. Now in no way, shape or form am I suggesting that you follow along here. If you are following along, you're doing so at your own risk and I strongly suggest that you do not do this. So I'm going to attach the probe right now. The screen is set to 200 volts per division. So as you can see, 200 volts per division. So we've got 200, 400, 600, and about 50. So about 650 volts peak happening right now. Now, the noise that we're hearing is occurring right here. You can see that little spike right there. And if you look over here, you'll see that little spike here. It's all the way along. So what I'm going to do is zoom on into that spike and I'll be right back. We'll look at eliminating that. So what we want to do is zoom on in to this little artifact right here on the waveform. So what I'll do is advance the time base here. As you can see we're already zooming in. And I'll adjust the vertical section, move the position up just a little bit, and give it a touch of brightness, and there it is. That is what's causing our buzz. That is known as ringing. And this is present right at the input of the reactor. So how are we going to get rid of this? Well, let's take a look at the schematic, and we'll talk about how to make this go away. This is the schematic that I drew up. So in the previous video, I reverse engineered this amplifier 
And again, this schematic only represents this particular amplifier and the other amplifier. I do not know if these amplifiers have been modified throughout time in any way, shape, or form. So what you see on this schematic is only as accurate as what's been found within the amplifier itself. I did talk about this design and explain this entire schematic in the previous video, which I will link below this video so you can click on that if you want to get up to speed with what was happening with this amplifier before this video. So the probe that's attached to the other oscilloscope is attached right here to the power supply. So this is right at the diodes. It's attached right here on the schematic. So what we're dealing with in this little area right here is a thing called ringing, and we want to get rid of that. You'll notice that we have capacitors here, but we don't have anything over here to try and get rid of that ringing. Now, this is a very, very fine balance. If we put too much capacitance here, this will no longer be 400 volts. This may move to 450, 500 volts, 550 volts all depending on how much capacitance we add on this side. So we want this reactor to do its job because really what it's doing at this point is it's also dropping our voltage down to 400. To give you an example, in the previous video, I put two capacitors, two electrolytic capacitors in series. So I added some capacitance from here to ground, pretty much just like this right here. So by adding a fair amount of capacitance here, this voltage will go extremely high, and that's what made this amplifier put out so much wattage. That was that little trivia question in the previous video there. I've answered it a bunch of times in the comments, but if you haven't come across it in the comments, that's what I did. I just put two capacitors, just like this, to ground on this side here. So basically what it's doing is when I'm adding two capacitors on this side to ground, it's basically taking this thing and making it just look like a resistor. So it's stopping it really from doing its reactor thing and it's making it look like just DC resistance at that point. This thing is basically not having to really do anything because there's a lot of filtering over here at this point. So what that does is that ups the voltage on this side very dramatically. So we don't want to do that. We want to keep this down here because the audio output transformer in this thing looks like it's only rated for about 50 watts and, or maybe even higher, maybe a little bit higher. And this thing makes 50 watts. If I put those two capacitors on here, this thing will make over a hundred watts clean. And it'll just sit there and do that as seen in the other video. Now, the EL34s can deal with the upped plate voltage that would appear at this point here. So this B plus attaches to here and then goes to the plates through the transformer. It can deal with that. But the audio transformer is looking a little bit small and I wouldn't want to hurt that transformer. So I really don't want to add those capacitors here. So all we want to do is we want to add just enough capacitance to get rid of that buzz or that ringing and not really affect this voltage. You know, if this is gonna move around you know, 10, 15 volts, something like that, not a big deal. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to experiment with capacitors at this point right here and find out which one is going to get rid of that ringing. These are the four capacitors that I'm going to add into circuit one by one individually, and we're going to take a look at each one of these capacitors effect on the ringing on the oscilloscope screen. Again, we're looking for a happy medium. Too much capacitance and the B plus in the amplifier is going to go high. Too little capacitance and we're not going to properly get rid of that ringing. So really we're looking for a happy medium. So the four capacitors are, we'll start with this one here, 0 0.015 microfarad, 0 0.1 microfarad, 0.47 microfarad, and 2 microfarad. So just before I go about showing this on the oscilloscope screen here, I'm going to show you something that catches a lot of techs off guard. And I think you're going to find this pretty fascinating. So do not try this at home. My meter here is set to DC volts, and I'm going to attach the probe lead here right to the input of the reactor. So right where the oscilloscope probe is attached right here on the schematic. So here we go. Attach this in here. 
And as you can see, there's 411 volts at that point right there. So say this is sitting on some tech's bench and the tech is, you know, has a speaker hooked up to this thing and he notices some power supply hum. And he's thinking, you know, maybe I can add a little bit of extra capacitance at that point in order to lower the power supply hum. Well, yes, it's going to lower the power supply hum. He's very correct. So now he's thinking, okay, I see 411 volts here. If I use a 450 volt capacitor, there should be enough of a safety margin, right? Wrong, very wrong. If you add any capacitance at this point, say for example, I was to add 22 microfarad of capacitance at this point to ground. This is going to shoot up to almost 600 volts. If this shoots up to 600 volts with that capacitor there, that's exceeding 450 volts quite bad. What will end up happening is that capacitor will explode. So this is a perfect example of what happened in that Thorderson amplifier that I serviced some time back. Somebody had put the wrong rating of capacitor there because they just read the DC volts. This is very deceiving. The reason this is deceiving is because at this point right now, we have pulsing DC. If you recall what we saw on the oscilloscope screen, we have 650 volts peak at this point right here. And that's where this gets a little bit deceiving. So adding a capacitor of 450 volts rating, even though we see 409 here, as soon as that capacitor goes in, this is gonna shoot way up, almost to 600 volts, and that capacitor is going to explode, or at the least, short out and fail, and cause damage to the power supply in here. So something to always keep in mind whenever you're dealing with a power supply that has a reactor in it and no filter capacitors right at the input. Adding any capacitance at the input of the reactor will cause the B plus voltage to shoot way up. I have the microphone placed close to the reactor so we can hear the difference and see the difference as well. So. What I'm going to do is bring that first capacitor to ground. So the first capacitor is that 0 0.015 microfarad capacitor. So I'll just bring this one to ground and we'll take a look at its effect on the screen and listen to what happens to the reactor. Well, we can still see that there's ringing there and it actually made it louder. So what I'll do is remove this connection here and we'll go to the next one now so the next one is 0.1 microfarad we'll see what this one does here we go as you can see it's still there a bit of a dip in there and it's still a little bit noisy so I'll remove this connection now what I'll do is I'll connect up the 0.47 microfarad capacitor. We'll see what happens. Look at that dead silent. Nice and clean looking. And the last one is 2 microfarad. So here we go. So now the 2 microfarad, you can see that really changed everything there. Now I've got my DC voltmeter attached to that same point that I had it attached to before when we were reading the 410 volts. When I attach the two microfarad capacitor, it jumps up to 416 volts. So I'll disconnect this again and it goes down to 408. So it's 408 volts now. So what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll attach up the 0.47 microfarad capacitor and I'll take a look at the voltage here. And it stays at 408, but we've got rid of the ring. So that is the magic number. We want to use 0.47 microfarad. That'll quieten things up and won't modify the B plus voltage. So what I'll do is I'll reposition the camera here and show you the difference on the actual voltmeter. I have the 0.47 microfarad capacitor attached to ground right now. You see that right here. And as you can see, we're at 408 volts. So what I'll do is I'll remove the ground and we'll take note of the difference. Do not try this at home. 
as you can see, we're pretty much at the same area. Very little difference, if anything at all. So yeah, pretty much no difference there. Whereas if I attach the two microfarad capacitor, you can see it jumps up to 415. So quite a bit of difference there. So this one here is a happy medium that pretty much gets rid of all the ring and makes things nice and quiet. So that is the value that I'm going to go with. Here's an example of using the Carlson Super Probe in place of an oscilloscope to help us locate the issues in this amplifier. And right now, we're trying to get rid of the ring from that reactor. So what I'm going to do is the exact same thing I did with the oscilloscope hooked up, except no oscilloscope. We're just going to use the Carlson Super Probe. I have the non-contact probe in the detection position or the noise position. What I'm going to do is just turn on the super probe and give it just a touch of audio. And you can hear it's listening to the ringing in that reactor quite nicely. So what I'm going to do, just like I did with the oscilloscope, is I'm going to bring this end of this capacitor towards ground. I'm going to do that with this jumper clip here. Do not try this at home. So I'll turn up the audio here. Now watch what happens. Just that easy. I'll open the connection here again. So we can tell that this is detecting that issue as well. So for those of you that are new to this channel or don't know what a Carlson Super Probe is, this is an extremely sensitive non-contact style probe. Now, when I say non-contact style, I'm using a rubber band just to hold this on the reactor so I don't have to use both hands to do all this here. So when I say non-contact style probe, this doesn't make any electrical connection into the circuit here, yet this will electrically listen in the circuitry here for an issue. For example, say one of these resistors was noisy, say it was crackly or staticky, or say one of the capacitors was noisy. All I would need to do is just bring this close to the noisy component and this would detect it and play it through the speaker here very loudly. Same thing with a capacitor or if say there was a, an inductor here that had maybe an intermittent connection inside or it was crackly, maybe some arcing or something like that. This would very, very quickly detect all that. And that's what this is designed for. Now this has all sorts of different uses. You can use this in radio repair. It detects RF quite nicely. If you're say working on a, a receiver and one of the IF stages is missing, you can just go from IF transformer to IF transformer and it'll, you can see where the signal goes missing almost immediately. So for those of you that are interested in building something like this, this is an extremely useful tool and I use it all the time. I have all the plans and the circuit board layouts and everything on Patreon. All you need to do is just print out the circuit board layouts, use a toner transfer method, everything is already sized, and you can build a Carlson Super Probe for yourself. It's all right there. The amplifier is complete and I'm happy with the results. As you can see, I've installed four 0.47 microfarad capacitors. So there's two in parallel and two in parallel, and these are in series, which means that I end up with 0.47 microfarad, but at 1260 volts. So that's nice and safe to have on this end of the reactor over here, and everything is suspended above all the other parts. And it grounds right in the center of the star grounding system. So everything worked out really quite nice. So I have to leave the bottom end of this amplifier open because now I need to do this all over again on the other amplifier. Of course, I'll be doing that off of camera. So the project is complete. In order to give you the most accurate representation of the amount of noise that this amplifier is making through the speaker right now, I have the microphone at a set distance away from the speaker and I'm also standing a set distance away from the speaker with a pair of studio monitor headphones on right now. So if I take the studio monitor headphones off, what I hear coming out of this speaker is almost identical to when I have the studio monitor headphones on. 
So for example, if I put my hands right at the speaker level and rub my fingers together, that's the same loudness with the studio monitor headphones on or off. So what you hear right now is the amount of noise that this amplifier is making, and it's virtually nothing. It's very, very low. So all in all, I'm happy with the way that this amplifier turned out. And now I've got to get going on the second one. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. I hope you enjoyed this episode involving the troubleshooting and modification of this vacuum tube audio amplifier. If you did enjoy the video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more episodes coming like this in the near future. We'll be taking a look at modern and antique electronics, solid state and vacuum tube electronics alike. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a different and very effective way, you might want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I have the link just below this video in the description and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section. If you haven't checked out the previous video that led up to this video, I'll also have that link in the description as well. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.